A chaotic scene from the chain reaction crash. The driver arrested. Was alcohol to blame? Special prosecutor, the calls from within Donald Trump's own party over those reported contacts with Russians. And we need to do it because they are bad people. Why this top Republican thinks the attorney general should bow out as Donald Trump says no thank you to a long-held Washington tradition. Why is he snubbing the annual White House Correspondents' Dinner? Plus, Democrats select a new leader, his first move to unite the party. And Oscar night, excitement in Hollywood is off the charts. I really, truly, in this moment, feel like a superstar. We're behind the scenes with Hollywood A-listers rehearsing their parts as last night's Indie Spirit Awards set the stage for the glitz and glamour tonight. Moonlight! Will it be lit by Moonlight? Plus how politics will figure into the evening. Celebrities already speaking their minds. The first attack on democracy is an assault on free expression and civil liberties. We're right there on the red carpet. Why it's not really red and why this year's fashions are more exclusive than ever. The vote of confidence from the host, Jimmy Kimmel. No one does Oscar like GMA. Live from ABC News in New York, this is Good Morning America. Thanks to Jimmy Kimmel for that shout out on a Sunday morning. Thanks for joining us, everybody. It is Oscar Sunday, and there it is. The Dolby Theater in Los Angeles, a little wet there, where Hollywood's heavy hitters will gather tonight for the 89th Academy Awards. Yeah, you, you can see the raindrops that Rob Marciano had us put on the screen there. They've also put up some materials <laughs> to protect the red carpet from the rain that's expected to roll through. And once the stars run the gauntlet of fans and photographers, they're going to mount these stairs and head up there into the theater. We are covering all the angles this morning, the front runners, the fashion, the possibility that some of the winners will get political from the stage tonight. And Dan, you mentioned something a couple moments ago that maybe it's not really the red carpet. We'll yes, to the bottom of that. it's apparently not red. We'll be talking about that. Uh, but speaking of politics, yeah. there's a lot of news coming out of Trump world. We're going to be covering that as well this morning. First here, though, we do have some breaking news involving a vehicle that crashed into a crowd at a pre-Mardi Gras parade in New Orleans. Dozens have been heard, and ABC's Adrian Bankert is right there on the scene with the very latest on this investigation. Good morning, Adrian. Good morning, Paula. Yes, we're here at University Medical Center, one of the many hospitals where the injured have been treated. Now, because this happened on a street adjacent to the parade, people were still throwing beads as this frightening scene played out. Overnight, chaos during the final weekend of Mardi Gras. At 6.42 p.m., this gray pickup truck was seen driving on Carrollton Avenue. On East and North Carrollton Avenue, a vehicle struck the crowd. Moments later, that truck barreling into a crowd of revelers near the start of one of the largest parades with some of the biggest crowds. The driver striking two cars and a dump truck. Yeah, we got, we got multiple injured, multiple injured, and all three injured before running over and injuring more than two dozen people. It sounded like a car was just revving up its engine. And when I turn around, I see everybody running towards us, almost like trampling over us, and they're screaming, get out of the street. Most of the parade watchers in the truck's path had to be sent to the hospital, some in critical condition right now. The driver immediately arrested. Uh, we suspect that that subject uh, was highly intoxicated. As EMS and police officers race to help the injured, the parade can be seen marching on just beyond the horrific scene. Debris littering the streets, this car mangled from the collision. It just happened so quickly, you really didn't have time to think about it. Now, one of those witnesses we talked to said that from his perspective, just feet from that truck, he saw the driver swerving to try to avoid people. Police are investigating. Dan? Adrian, thank you. Reporting from the scene this morning, we appreciate it. We're going to move now, though, to President Trump, who is escalating yet again his war with the press, announcing now that he's not going to attend the annual White House Correspondents' Dinner, where the president and the media normally exchange jokes. Also this morning, there's a headline that won't make anyone in the White House laugh. A top Republican calling for a special prosecutor to investigate Team Trump's t ties to Russia. ABC's David Curley is covering it all from the North Lawn. David, good morning to you. Morning, Dan. The question this morning is, will other Republicans join that call for an independent special prosecutor to look into the allegations that have fueled the president's battle with the media? And that is, did his campaign have repeated contacts with the Russians leading up to the election? 
After dining with his daughter Ivanka and Jared Kushner, among others, at his hotel in Washington, D.C., this morning the president is battling reports again of ties to Russia, with a senior member of his own Republican Party now saying those reported contacts need a special investigation. We need to investigate their activities, and we need to do it because they are bad people. California Congressman Darrell Issa saying the attorney general should bow out and appoint a special prosecutor. Jeff Sessions, who was on the campaign and who was an appointee, you're going to need to use the special prosecutor's statute. The intelligence committees in both the House and Senate are investigating the reports, and the White House says both chairmen were asked to try to tamp down the media reports. We are fighting the fake news. It's fake, phony, fake. After weeks of sparring with the news media, Mr. Trump took to Twitter to announce, quote, I will not be attending the White House Correspondents Association dinner this year. Please wish everyone well and have a great evening. He has attended in the past as a guest, even the target of President Obama in 2011. You fired Gary Busey. And these are the kind of decisions that would keep me up at night. The White House Correspondents Association responded saying the dinner will go on. It will be a celebration of the First Amendment. Paula? Certainly will, David. Thank you for your reporting from the North Lawn this morning. And a fiercely divided Democratic Party that is still reeling from losing the White House has chosen a new national leader who wants to ensure that Trump is a one-term president. Tom Perez, the former Labor Secretary under President Obama, won a tightly contested race, becoming the DNC chairman. And Gloria Riviera is in Atlanta, where it all went down. Good morning, Gloria. Good morning, Paula. So many Democrats here in Atlanta telling me they feel like finally their party is turning a new page after that devastating loss last November. Now President Trump chimed in rather quickly, sending somewhat insincere congratulations. He tweeted that he was happy for the new DNC chair, Tom Perez, but also his own Republican Party. The DNC chair came right back at him on Twitter, vowing that Democrats across the country will soon be the president's worst nightmare. Overnight, the embattled Democratic Party finding new leadership. After a contentious race for national chair, Tom Perez, former labor secretary under Obama, edging out rival Keith Ellison. Perez vowing to spearhead the party's recovery and more. We need a chair who can not only take the fight to Donald Trump, we also need a chair who can lead turnaround and change the culture of the Democratic Party. In a show of unity, Perez nominated the man who came in second to be his official number two. New Deputy Chair Ellison is the first Muslim to serve in the U.S. Congress and has widespread progressive support. We got to win elections. We're in this mess because we lost not one election, but a thousand elections. The two men now charged with restructuring, a party still reeling from Hillary Clinton's devastating loss. Congresswoman Waters, your party is recovering from the worst political defeat in modern American politics. What has to happen now? Well, first of all, we have to be unified. And I think we saw indications of that uh, after the vote was announced here today. A key question, of course, will be how many progressives who supported Bernie Sanders and also supported the man who came in second, Keith Ellison, will now get behind the new DNC chair. The president had more to say this morning over Twitter. He wrote, the race for DNC chairman was, of course, totally rigged. Bernie's guy, like Bernie himself, never had a chance. Clinton demanded Perez. That is what the president had to say about all of this this morning. Paula, Dan. Gloria, thank you. Let's bring in ABC News chief anchor George Stephanopoulos, who's going to be hosting this week later this morning. Good morning. Good morning, guys. So uh, the Democrats are in rough shape in that they've lost the White House. They've lost both houses of Congress. They've lost nearly two thirds of the state houses. What is the strategy going forward? Do they take on Trump in an all out war or do they try to moderate and cooperate with him at certain junctures? I don't think they have much choice. The leadership has much choice right now because you see at the grassroots of the Democratic Party right now, and you've seen it in that town hall meetings all across the country, that the, the Democrats at the grassroots are pushing hard for full out opposition to Donald Trump across the board. Now, that could pose a bit of a dilemma for those Democrats in states won by Donald Trump who are up in 2018 in the Senate who, who might feel more compelled 
to cooperate with him, but all the energy at the grassroots now on the Democratic side is for all-out opposition. And the Russia situation is not going away. We just heard that Daryl Issa is now calling for a special prosecutor to investigate this. Do you think that's likely to happen? Uh, right now, it's not. I mean, but this is, it is pretty interesting that a key top Republican has broken. This was someone who really went after Hillary Clinton uh, as well. And you also saw all week long at these town meetings, Republican members of Congress not only get pressure on health, but get pressure on Russia as well. Some Republicans now saying Donald Trump is going to have to release his tax returns as well. So you're seeing this energy bubble up. But, I, but, it, uh, but at this point, it has not reached the kind of critical mass that I think will cause President Trump to buckle and call for a special prosecutor. So on Tuesday night, we're going to see President Trump speaking to a joint session of Congress for the first time. What do you expect to hear? And do you expect, uh, as we're hearing from some people, that there may be some heckling from the Democrats in the crowd? Uh, I'm not sure about overt heckling. I mean, we might, we might not have a you lie moment like we saw up against President Obama, but a lot of Democrats are talking about bringing uh, guests to the, to the chamber who they say are victims of President Trump's apologies, uh, policies, refugees, undocumented mm -hmm. uh, immigrants, those who may lose uh, Obamacare. As for the president himself, this is his real first chance to kind of lay out in more specific detail what he wants to do on Obamacare and tax cuts. Even though we're now 38 uh, days in, the president hasn't said exactly what he wants on those big issues. That's what everybody's going to be listening for. George, thank you. Always Thanks, a pleasure George. to chat with you on a Sunday morning. And a reminder that George has a big show this morning. He's going to go one on one with the newly elected DNC chair, Tom Perez. And ahead of the president's first joint address to Congress, George is going to speak with the Democratic leader, Nancy Pelosi. It's all coming up on this week. And we should say on Tuesday night, George leads the entire powerhouse ABC News team for live coverage of the president's address to Congress. That starts at 9 Eastern. Thanks See again, you guys George. Thank Thanks, George. As we said earlier, politics may play a prominent role at the Oscars. Tonight. It won't come as a surprise to a whole lot of people, but this awards night could be one of the most political that we have ever seen. So what kind of fiery attacks can we expect? ABC's Chris Connolly is in Hollywood for us this morning. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, guys. From behind me, you see the stairs up which performers, presenters, and winners-to-be will ascend and into the Dolby Theater, where on Oscar night, you'll have an open mic and millions of viewers and some people, one expects, with a few things on their mind. Tonight at the 89th Oscars, the talk is expected to get a little political because it already has. It's our time to tell our elected officials to do their job. On Friday, instead of its Oscar party, United Talent Agency, kicking off Academy Award weekend with the United Voices anti-Trump rally. We must speak for those who cannot speak. All five directors of this year's Oscar-nominated foreign language films signing this letter condemning nationalist politics. We want this award to stand as a symbol of the unity between nations and the freedom of the arts. All this year, actors speaking their minds from the award show stages. And this immigrant ban is a blemish and it is un-American. At the Golden Globes, Meryl Streep using her lifetime achievement acceptance speech to put then-president-elect Trump on blast. When the powerful use their position to bully others, we all lose. Trump firing back in a tweet. Meryl Streep, one of the most overrated actresses in Hollywood. Tonight, Streep is nominated for the 20th time a record for actresses. She's also scheduled to present here at the Dolby Theater, which has seen its share of entertainers setting it off during the Academy Awards. Where we have a man sending us to war. We've got to have equal rights for everyone. Equal rights for women in the United States of America. So as you see, politics is a perennial topic of conversation from the stage at the Oscars. And so this year certainly won't be any different. I think we'll see more of it. Interesting to see the reaction in the House if things get contentious up on stage, guys. Thank you, Chris. We'll check in with you a little bit later because we have much more Oscars coverage coming up in just a minute. But we want to get to some of the other news this morning. So let's go to Ron with the rest of the day's headlines. Good morning, Ron. Uh, good morning to you, Dan and Paula, Diane. Robert? <laughs> I wasn't here waiting. We're going to begin one. in Houston, where uh, police are looking for the woman who fired into a crashed car, killing an eight year old girl. The girl's mother says a speeding vehicle ran a red light and then hit her car. Then a third car drove up. A woman got out of that vehicle and opened fire. One of the shots killed Damari Atkins, a three year old, a third grade, that is, an honor student. Police are looking for at least two suspects in that case. And new details in the assassination of the half-brother of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Malaysia's health minister says 
that Kim Jong-nam died within 15 to 20 minutes after being poisoned at Kuala Lumpur International Airport. Police say the airport is now safe. Officials say safe for the uh, travelers going through there with no signs of hazardous materials. That announcement coming nearly two weeks since Kim was killed there, during which time tens of thousands of people passed through that terminal. And a military judge says that Sergeant Bo Bergdahl can stand trial despite comments from then-candidate Donald Trump that he should be executed. Bergdahl walked away from his base in Afghanistan in 2009. He spent five years as a Taliban prisoner and now faces a court-martial that could result in a life sentence. His lawyers argue that Trump's remarks prejudiced the case against Bergdahl. That trial could begin in April. And a Florida man is uh, facing arson charges for allegedly setting a fire at a country club and then posting video of it on Snapchat. A teenager who saw the video called police, and police say that Anthony Stowers admitted to starting the fire but said he didn't remember doing it because he was drunk. Uh, no one was hurt in that fire. Now, turning to sports, Gonzaga went into their final game of the regular season Saturday with a chance at a perfect record. Guess what happened? Number one ranked Bulldogs, 29-0 going into that game, 20-point favorites. Shot out to an early lead, but unranked BYU Brigham Young came back to upset Gonzaga, winning by eight, spoiling Gonzaga's uh, bid for a perfect season. But they still have, obviously, a chance in the March Madness. And finally, some real dedication on the links. PGA golfer Sean, Sean Stephanie, Stephanie <laughs> trying to get himself out of a water hazard, stripping down to his underwear. They hit a shot out of that uh, pond or lake at a tournament in Florida on Friday. Children, close your eyes, please. Seems he didn't want to get stuck uh, playing the rest of the round in wet, muddy clothing. He gets uh, regarbed there. Despite the extra <laughs> effort, Stephanie, he missed the cut. I gotta so start he's, watching he's golf. Out. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's missing looking. out all this yeah. time. I had no idea. Yeah, well, it happens rarely. My new favorite yeah. sport. I think he's looking <laughs> for an underwear sponsor at this point. <laughs> yeah, may get oh, one. Huh? Oh my gosh. Yeah, or a, a wetsuit sponsor. <laughs> all right. Didn't see that coming, Ron. Thank you. Uh, let's get it back over to Rob for the weather. Hey, Rob. Hard to believe this happened uh, end of February. This is very spring-like stuff that we endured yesterday in part because of the record heat. Look what happened in, in parts of Pennsylvania there. Uh, Lucerne County there was a tornado warning, and they're going to actually, we didn't get it on tape, but certainly the damage looks like it may be one. The National Weather Service is going to go out there today and uh, check things out. You see the debris and all the uh, damage that was done with that. Hail as well, not only there, but up and down the, this line. This is Richmond, Virginia, golf ball size uh, hail. We had some severe weather blow through western parts of uh, Massachusetts with uh, several thousand people without power for a time there. The front now pushing east. We saw flood watches for northern New York and northern New England because the snow melt, the snow has been melting plus the the rainfall. Yesterday we had temperatures in the lower 70s across Burlington, Vermont, all-time record for the month of February. But look at these changes now. It's now the freezing mark up there. Temperatures uh, falling a good 20, 30 degrees. And with the winds this morning, it feels like in the teens and 20s in many areas. So winter is coming back, at least for now. But we'll see a bounce back, I think, by midweek. Temperatures going from the 30s to the 50s in Buffalo, maybe into the 70s back in through D.C. But we'll get back into a cooler regime towards the weekend. That's a quick check in the National Outlook. Here now are your local forecast. Heavy winter coats definitely needed this morning. Feels like temps in the 20s in the teens for Hagerstown, so definitely bundle up. Winter has returned hour by hour today. Temperatures only getting into the upper 40s, but due to the wind, it will feel much cooler than that, but we will enjoy plenty of bright sunshine right through this afternoon. Next big change up arrives on Monday. It's going to be warmer already with a high of 57. Should hit Wednesday, should hit 70 by Wednesday rather, but it will come with a price and that is wet weather. Next half hour, we'll go west coast. Not because of you, but we're going to go out there okay. and, and talk about California and more snow in Seattle. Back to the Oscars <laughs> now. Uh, they're making the final touches this morning uh, for the big show tonight. And did you know that, that thing on carpet isn't really red? I, I didn't Just know that. Just appears red, But right? apparently, Kena Whitworth is in Hollywood with some fun Oscars facts. She's going to have the answer to that question and a behind-the-scenes look at how it all gets put together. Good morning to you, Kena. And you're looking lovely, by the way, this morning. Oh, Paula, thank you so much. Normally I'm covering a bit of a natural disaster, but uh, we have a whole different flood on our hands here. In just a few hours, a flood of stars will be taking to this red carpet. But as you mentioned, is it really red? According to the LA Times, the color is called Academy Red, but you know, it's a bit more of a burgundy. The actual color remains a secret. Why? It's because it's specially formulated to make sure that everyone dazzles in their gowns and tuxes. This morning, as the nominees are waking up for one of the biggest nights of their lives, the stage inside the Dolby Theater is getting glammed up.
adorned with 300,000 sparkling crystals. Overnight, some of the biggest names in Hollywood already feeling out that stage. Moana's Lin-Manuel Miranda and Dwayne The Rock Johnson making themselves at home. Jennifer Aniston testing the mic and John Legend taking his place behind the piano, all in preparation for the big show. But those who don't get to take home a real statue might have a chance at a 24 karat gold chocolate Oscar, famously crafted by Governor's Ball mastermind chef Wolfgang.